Welcome. You're tuned into Life is a Sacred Journey. Every week, we bring a new perspective to aging and caregiving. Here is your host, Michelle Pope. Good morning, friends. Good morning and good morning. Good morning, Audrey. Audrey White obtained her Master's of Public Health from the University of Michigan with a focus in health behavior and education. After studying at the Grief Coach Academy with Aurora Winter, who I've heard a lot about, and becoming a certified grief coach in 2019, Audrey realized her passion and purpose, and we know, you know, we talk a lot about that, to help people through grief. In 2023, she took over running the Grief Coach Academy with Aurora's blessing and ongoing support. It's always great to have a mentor. Audrey understands grief post personally and professionally. In 2022, her brother died, died tragically when he was shot and killed by his wife, who then took her own life. Audrey was with her mother in 2020 when she died and was able to hold sacred space for her and her mother was able to say to her that this was the best thing, this was the best time that I could have with you. And so we know life is so precious. Audrey knows life is so precious. Audrey, I agree with you. I too lost my brother recently and in the last couple of years and it, it is a pain that I have not been able to shake. And I don't think I want to. I just think that I'm living in it, but I'm living in it yeah with an open, broken heart, is, is another friend of mine says. So Audrey invites you to join her for her online trainings. She's got all kinds of things going on. I went to her website this morning. It is well, uh, you know, it, it shows you all the events, the dates, and the links in which you can do that. Um, she's available to speak in the Silicon Valley area. That means around here where, where we are. So you never know. Audrey might show up at one of ASEB's events and uh, we'll let you know Absolutely. when that happens. So good morning, Audrey White. Thank you so much for being open to chaos this morning. <laughs> and, um, also, thank you for uh, hearing your calling about paving a path from pain to peace. So let's Let's talk about one, I want to hear a little bit about, and you can weave this in, um, about the Grief Coach Academy and, and, and that relationship. Mm -hmm. But you, you talk a little bit in your bio what put you on this path, but would you share with the rest of us, you know, you, you found your purpose um, and then you, you went for it and you're living it. So tell us what brought you there. And thank you for being um, here. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. First, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here. And I love that you're in, in the Bay Area. So we're going to have to meet up soon. I would love that. Um, anytime we can partner together and, and, and share, um, I am all for it. Yes. Um, as far as like how I got here, I want to talk a little bit about how I grew up. Because I really think that has a big impact on why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. So I grew up in a small little town in northern lower Michigan on the shore of Lake Huron, about 4,000 people. Like we had the only stoplight in the entire county. That's how small it was. <laughs> and, uh, and I was the youngest of three children. My oldest brother was 15 years older than I, John, who's, um, who passed in 2022. And I have a middle, we have a middle brother. And I never felt like... I fit in with my family. I always felt like I was on the outside, even from a, being a little girl. And I had experience, I mean, we all grow up with some kind of trauma in our lives or some kind of challenge or difficulty. My father was an alcoholic. Uh, my mother was a, you know, tr a classic codependent. So that was what was modeled for us, right? What was modeled for me. You know, I, I also have uh, sexual um, abuse in my family and I was uh, molested as a, a young child by an older cousin. All of this kind of set up for me to be just this, um, I was really steeped in my codependency for a long time. I was the people pleaser. I was the, you know, don't make any waves. But I was also the one, I called myself. I remember when I was 16, I gave my father a happy birthday card that said from the black sheep. And because that's how I felt. I felt like I was this black sheep. And I read something this morning from the holistic psychologist at 
two in the morning when my dog woke me up um, about the black sheep and how we see things clear. Like we see the things, the dysfunction, we see the, um, we want to talk about the things that no one else wants to talk about. We want to talk about the elephant in the room and we don't understand why it's not being discussed. We don't understand as children, as you know, even teens, even young adults, we don't understand why we feel so on the outside. And so that's how I really grew up. Always wanted to talk about the things that no one wants to talk about. And fast forward to 2005, my um, father was dying and he had a brief illness and I flew to Texas to be with them. My brother had been there for a little while. He was getting a little bit better and that was short lived. I had about a, a day and a half with him while he was still lucid, but the doctors weren't really telling us what was going on. So when it finally came down to, there's nothing more we can do. When the doctor finally said that to my mother, I mean, I just saw her fall in her chair and she just collapsed. And I bent down beside her and I said, mom, we know how to do this. This is just birth. Yeah. You know, as women, we know how to hold that space. We know, we know the pain of birth. We understand it. And this is all it is. We are just going to birth into the other side. And honestly, I was in my mid thirties. I don't know where that, that came from. Mm -hmm. Because when I flew out to Texas, I was like, holy shit, this is, sorry. No, no, <laughs> this that's is, a good, that's a good word. That's a good word. <laughs> Ew. Yes, it is. And, um, and, and I wasn't ready for it. Like I knew I was dreading getting on that plane and because I wasn't ready to lose my daddy. And because we, we didn't have that clarity from the medical staff. We never took the, that opportunity to say goodbye and to really relish in those moments. So that evening we were holding vigil. It was my brother had driven back to Tennessee and it was really important for to my mother to have John with us before she would kind of let him go. So we held the vigil all night and that's the birth pains, right? That's the, mm -hmm. the singing and the praying and the holding space with uh, my mother and, you know, aunts and uncles that were there. And the moment my brother walked into the room, my mother fell apart. And I just walked over to the side of the bed by my, where my dad was. And I put my hand on his heart, hand on his head. And I just held him as he let go. It was in that moment where I was like, this is why I'm in this family. Because I, I innately know how to do death. Yeah. And it was this, this whole thing of like, this is why, because I'm able to do this. Yes. And it was the first time I really experienced that. And then fast forward, because life happens, right? I, I knew I wanted to work in grief and, and loss and death and dying, because I don't think we talk about it. And we don't talk about it in our society. Right. We push it away. We think we're going to live forever, or we, we pretend we do. And all of this, you know, is focused on extending life for as long as possible without really talking about quality and, and, and what's really important. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, I went through the group, I met Aurora <laughs> in 2019 as my life was falling apart because my codependent <laughs> was yeah. like off the hook. Um, Jesus, I was with a narcissist for six years who really destroyed my sense of self destroyed my belief in my intuition. And what I know is that I was perfectly set up. I was perfectly groomed for this being, you know, a, a very much an empath, very much a codependent. Like this was like, let me take on your stuff. That, that was me for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to say that after that experience, <laughs> it cured me of anything like that finally learned boundaries at 50 something right yeah um yeah. i know and but it's it's a lifelong thing you yeah. know we're, we live in our trauma and we until we really recognize it and have these experiences to pull us out yeah 
So I went through the Grief Coach Academy training and so much of it was healing my own grief, my grief for self, my grief for the time I lost, the grief that of the dreams I lost, you know, along with the death of my father. And then 2020 hit and the whole world is grieving at this point. We don't know where we're at. We've lost our sense of community. We lost our sense of connection and just how we work, how we live was all up in the air. And we were living under this umbrella of fear for quite some time. And I think there was a whole lot of, you know, unexpressed and unrecognized and unlabeled grief at that time, because we, we weren't, we were all in that sense of survival at that point. Yeah. So we weren't looking at, okay, what is this? And 2020 kicked off for me, March of 2020. Um, I started losing family members. I lost a cousin. A few weeks later, it was an uncle. A few weeks later, it was my cousin's wife, who I know died of a broken heart. I lost a total of eight family members in a year, including my mother. And, you know, as you said, um, well, around my mother's time, um, 13 days before she died, her one of her sisters died. And all of us cousins, we knew, like, oh, let's just hold on to our hats because they're all going to go. All the sisters are not going to want to stay. Right. If one goes, they're all going to go because they're not going to want to stay here without each other. And so my Aunt Mady died at the end of September. About a week later, my mother was in the hospital. Oh, my. And, yeah, it was it was really yeah. quick. Oh. and I. I remember her saying when, when my aunt died, that's one less connection I have in the world. And it, I could, you know, it really broke her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when she went into the hospital, she had gone in with pneumonia and I flew out as soon as I could. Like she was in Kansas where my brother lived. And um, the hospital staff was amazing. You know, once we figured out, like she had, lost the ability to swallow. And so I'm watching all of these tests being performed on her. And I'm like, it's just, it's just not working. Her body is just wearing out yeah. and it's okay. Yeah. And I think because of the, the skills that I've learned through the Grief Coach Academy, through doing my own work, for our being the black sheep who wants to talk about everything no one wants to talk about, I was able to say to my mom, you haven't eaten for a few days. You can no longer drink any, you can't even take a sip of water without choking. We only have a few days left. Are you ready to die? I was very direct and she said, yes. <laughs> All right, you know, let's do this because, you know, she was embracing it. And because I could hold that space for her, she could relax into it and go, okay. And she talked for, I think, three days straight. I don't know where she got the strength, but we talked and we laughed and we cried. I heard stories I had never heard. Right. Um, the hospital staff just kind of shut the door on us. My brother and I were with her the entire time. And it was just, it was so beautiful to be able to, to be there and hold that space. And this was in the middle of COVID. So I know like how precious and blessed we were to yes. have that time. Yes. So many people weren't able to be with their loved ones. They, you know, yeah. I mean, people lost a lot. So to have one, to have that experience, regardless of when that happened, but to have it during COVID, it was nothing short of sacred and, you know, Everybody was watching over us, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. God source yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. And and so it was really beautiful, but and we had an amazing funeral for like we danced with, you know, and my cousins who had just gone through all of um this all of these consecutive losses, mm -hmm. you know, comes to the funeral that my brother and I planned for her. 
and we're playing music because my dad was a musician and they loved to dance together. Yeah. And so we're playing music and dancing on her grave site. Uh, yeah. And they're like, this is the most fun funeral we've ever been to. <laughs> Yes. But it was a yes. celebration. It's a celebration. Yes, yes. You know, the thing uh, that you just said that's it's like bubbling up in me, Audrey, in, and for all of you out there, that whole idea of being the black sheep of your family. And that's, again, what Audrey's talking about is the design of purpose, right? There's a design for the purpose of your life. And there are certain places where you identify, even as a young person. And when she said black sheep, I already told you guys I was the black sheep of my family. And, and it was because I saw things that other people, I thought they didn't see. I now know they saw it, but they didn't want to talk about it. And I learned, like some of you, what Audrey's talking about, to avoid my intuition to avoid the behaviors that would open the portals to my understanding of the bigger picture of what was going on around me. And so what Audrey is saying to you right now is that sometimes we use, um, and that when I say we use, I mean, you don't make it, sometimes it's not a choice. You don't go to a place and push a button and it comes to you, but right. it's a sabotaging of your life purpose and your life spirit so that you can't feel joy. Do you know what I, so I, I want you to hear what Audrey's saying because I know many of you out there, you've written to me and I know you, and that's what's happened. Sometimes you get stuck in that place where you can't feel joy anymore. You don't even know what it looks like. And it's because yeah. of trauma and grief and pain and people who saw you and victimize you. But what we're yeah. talking about is the other side, how to yeah. get there, right? How to get to there. So Audrey, I just, I just had to share with them because what you're saying is like, bubbling up in my spirit where there's so many people that are, you know, on that path of pain and don't know that yeah. there's peace. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it's such a, it's a lifelong thing. Like I, I left my family, um, you know, the, when I went to college and the first thing I did was join a, a adult children of alcoholics group. I was 18 years old, knowing I needed help. I sat in that and never said a word the entire session because I, I didn't have, I couldn't have the, I didn't have the voice at the time yeah. to say yeah. that. And I didn't know, I, I was so traumatized and I just wasn't, but I knew I needed that. So I've always been doing the self-help and searching for stuff and finding what, what works for me. And it's such a lifelong thing. Just recently, gosh, it was back in April when I realized I had never felt safe in my entire life. I didn't feel safe in my home. I didn't feel safe at school. I didn't feel safe at my cousins who I pr practically grew up there. So there was no place in my life that I felt safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. until now. Mm -hmm. And it's the work I've done through my grief, through the processes that we have, but also through my therapist, through my spiritual center, through ridding myself of the toxicity of the people around me and having a really good core of like, who really supports me yes. and wants me to succeed. And now I know that I have my back. I don't have to look at anybody else to have my back, I do. And I've created this safety in me, but it was through this long journey to get there that I realized that I didn't have that. And it was so painful to, so there was that whole thing of grief, of grieving that part of like, I never felt safe. I think once I realized that, like I could actually feel like my nervous system for the first time in my life starting to calm down because I'd always lived in, you know, that fight or flight, that trauma response of survival. You know, once we recognize that, and learn how to create that sense of safety around us with boundaries, with honoring ourselves, with knowing that we're worthy, 
just because we are. Mm -hmm. And if we're all connected to one, there's no separation. That's when you can start really healing. Yes. Yes. Oh my so. God. You know, Audrey, this is a question that um, I know a lot of our folks that are out there joining us in this wonderful moment. And again, thank you so much for coming and bearing your spirit with us. There's a lot of people who are caregivers and they're caregivers of individuals um, who have forms of dementia, memory loss, that whole arena of cognition decline. And they're grieving every day, the loss of this, this person who they fell in love with, are in love with. And so it's, a, it's you know, I, I call it sometimes the never ending story that it just kind of keeps going and going and going until it isn't. And I'm always saying, be in the moment, be in the moment, similar to what you outlined in your experience with your mom and other folks, but help us and help those on that space in life. How do you grieve bit by bit by bit when the person is still there? You know, because okay. I think we do look at grief as the thing we do on the, uh, on the other side of the, the other side. Yeah. yeah, but grief can happen with the person physically there. Oh yeah. Question making. No. Okay. <laughs> so, I think it's, you know, that anticipatory grief. And and like you said, it's this ongoing daily grief because, and this is how I think of things as well. We have the point, the pain of the initial of the event, right? Yeah. But you're living in the event every single day with someone who is, who has dementia and Alzheimer's and you're seeing them and, and other diseases as well. You're seeing your loved one slip away from who they used to be into who they are. And I really believe that what really creates the suffering is our thoughts and our belief. So we have this, this, this event that happens. We can't change that. It's like when my brother was murdered, right? I can't change that. Yes. But it was the, the, the continual suffering that I was putting myself through. But I didn't, and I think a lot of people do this, where we don't realize we are at choice. We have this, this belief in our head. For me, it was my brother shouldn't have sacrificed his life. He shouldn't have had to sacrifice his life for her. And I was very angry and hurt from this. But when I started pulling that, that belief apart, one, I mean, I think to, to kind of preface this, beliefs are just thoughts we continue to think. It doesn't make it, make it true, doesn't make it false, it doesn't make it right or wrong, it's just a belief is something that we continue to hold on to and we refuse to let go. But when we have this process, and, and in the Grief Coach Academy, we talk about the peace method, mm -hmm. and it's a process to kind of pull apart our thoughts and our suffering. So my, my, one of my thoughts that was causing me suffering was he shouldn't have had to sacrifice his life. And the first part of that P is present, you know, present moment. So really looking at that and questioning, okay, is this thought in the past where it's, you know, that's the regret that we feel. Yeah. Is it in the future? That's the anxiety and the worry. Or is it in the present? And for me, it was in the past. So that's, that was this sense of regret that I was feeling, the sense of uh, I wanted things to be different. But our only point of power is in the present moment. It's only here that we can make and be a choice. So the next step of the Fuse Method is express. And so I allowed myself to just journal and, and say it out loud all the things that I thought, and let me be my petty ass self with this, <laughs> to, you know, it, so you don't hold back. We're always taught to hold back on our emotions. It's too strong. It's too this, it's, you know, in expressing our emotions fully, you know, I was angry at my brother. I found, you know, I'm like, why did you stay? You shouldn't have stayed. You knew she was mentally ill. And you still chose to stay in this. Why didn't you save yourself? You know, why didn't you get the guns out of the house when the matter? She bought her own. 
I'll tell you, I'll tell the story in a little while, but yeah. it was all of these things that were coming up. I was angry and I was more angry at my brother for not saving himself. And then once I kind of felt like I was empty from, you know, burying my soul and getting all of this out, what that does, it allows a little bit of an opening in this, this holding on to this belief. So now I've expressed everything. I can open it up. Yeah. And we move into A, which is accept mm-hmm. or appreciate. Mm-hmm. And can I just accept the fact that this happened? Can I accept the fact and the thought that my brother sacrificed his life? And what was surprising to me is that I actually could find some appreciation in that because I was thinking about and remembering how my brother lived his life. My brother was a man of his word, a man of his duty and honor. He took care of my mother. He felt it was his job and as the oldest, you know, and he wanted to take care of my mother when she could no longer live by herself. That was the same thing with his wife. Mm-hmm. He knew she was mentally ill. He knew from the, from the very beginning. And he made that choice. He never spoke about it. People in their community didn't know kind of the depth of all of this because he never spoke about it. Because for him to speak ill of someone was not who he was. So in a, you know, really remembering that's how my, my brother lived his life, mm-hmm. I could move into C, which is the contrary. So what else could be true? Because all of this is kind of letting go of, it's opening up the, the hold that we have on our belief. So what else could be true? What could be true in this instance is that my brother made a choice. This is how he lived his life. He willingly sacrificed his life. He would, if any, in any other circumstance, he would have sacrificed his life for her or anyone else. So who am I to judge? Yeah. But this isn't, isn't how he chose on some soul level. Yeah. Who, who am I to judge that? And so knowing that I had now, now there's like different truths that I have to look at. And so that belief that he shouldn't have sacrificed his life became, this is who he was. And he lived his life the way he needed to, mm-hmm. to the very end. Mm-hmm. And then the last part of it, you know, kind of enthusiasm, which sometimes is a hard thing for people to reach for. But that's where I got to. It's like he truly lived his life yeah. in, in accordance to his values and accordance to his integrity, not according to mine. Right. I would have made a different choice. But he lived according to his values and his life and his integrity. And who am I to judge that? Yes. And so going through that process with my brother, it, it, it helped me to just release that hold that I had on that, that anger and that pain. And it is, it is completely shifted how I think about it. Mm-hmm. it. I still miss him every single day. There's not a moment that goes by that I don't miss him. I don't miss the sound of his voice. I don't, I, I miss like I miss being able to pick up the phone and call him, but I'm so glad that I like I save voicemails. I've got you know messages where he's saying happy birthday to me, and you know it's it's I will keep those forever because they're so precious. And so it doesn't change what happened, but it allows me to ex- accept it. Yes. So people. What we're talking about also is that being with your loved one in that moment. People with Alzheimer's dementia may forget moments, may even at some point forget you, Mm -hmm. which is the hardest thing. But the thing that I have noticed is that the essence of that person is still there. What I say to people is that that endearing love that they had for you still remains because when they see you walk into a room, they still light up. They just can't remember the context of how they met you, where you fit in. They call you a mother 
And then, uh, and people say, but I'm not his mother. I'm his wife. I'm, I'm like, yes, but he loves his it. mother and he sh he's showing that same sense of affection and love yeah. and understanding. So you can't be so literal in what I call soul relationship. Absolutely. And I think what yeah. you were saying, like with, with people who are doing this, you know, examine the thoughts that are causing you pain. Like you said, they want, they want what was, yeah. what was is, is, is changing and it's changing on a daily basis. How can we let go of what was yeah. cherish it because it's part of your memory and move into accepting what is. Right. And it's like looking at your thoughts about what the situation is. Like you said, you know, they're they're still expressing love for you. It doesn't matter what they call you. Yeah, just go with it because the feeling is there. That's right. You know, and music and, and singing, that still stays. That's so embedded in who we are. Yes. Put on some music. Sing a song that they loved because that will connect them back to their soul and who they are inside. That's something that we learn as children that stays with so many people, regardless of whether they know where they're at or not, it doesn't matter. Find that sense of where can we find the joy? And I was talking with someone recently who would, whose mother was going, she had died from uh, dementia and stuff, but she, it was a long thing. Mm -hmm. And she would go in and she, it was still important for her to pay for meals. So she was like paying with a poise pad or, you know, a receipt from someplace else. And like, they would just go with it. They're like, okay, well, you know, and she flipped the money on the other side. Yes. But it was that sense of just like, yeah, just go with it. Yes. You know? and, yes. and life has a, a wicked sense of humor at times. And, and if it, we can just be in the moment. Be in the moment and enjoy it. It's just like this morning, I have to say, I didn't break a sweat, friends. I, I was worried about you and, and, and what was going on, that Audrey couldn't hear me and all this. And I was worried that you guys would disappear, but not worried to the point that it was creating anxiety for me. You see the difference? Worry, yeah. stopping it at the point where it would go to a place of being anxious. It was more of like, if you push the right, keep pushing buttons, Michelle. <laughs> Eventually you'll hit the right button, right? <laughs> and I know that, that that's a moment that now I've learned something new. I've looked, I found the button, you guys, and it was a button I never had to hit before. So also looking at everything as an adventure and denial, Audrey, mm. plays a yeah. big role in holding on to this uh, and it holds back. Like when you were talking about um, uh, end of life and, and that transition, end of this plane versus the other and moving, giving a person permission to be where they are, it takes you out of that place of denial that nothing is happening to them, that they're not changing or that denial that, oh, it's not this level or, or, or he does, he's not like this, you know, you, you're still dragging them back into a place that they will never be able to, to be. And it's, it's unfair to you and it's definitely unfair to them. And I see that all the time. So can you talk about denial and grief a, a few minutes? We're going to keep you a little longer because we started later. Oh, perfect. The, the denial, <laughs> and, yeah. Denial and grief have a lot. They live in the same house, don't they? They, they do, they do, because denial, you know, like you said, it keeps you stuck in the past. Yeah. And anytime we're stuck in the past, we bring it forward and we keep reliving it and we keep reliving it. And it's this whole thing, this belief, especially I think in our society, that if we deny something, it's, it's, it's not going to happen, right? You know, I believe what it really does is it prolongs our grief, it delays it, and it just it's not that our body doesn't feel it because our bodies don't lie to us. You know, it, it's going to hold into our bodies and what isn't expressed is repressed and it will eventually seep out. Yep. And so then we get into these toxic behaviors mm -hmm. of, you know, alcohol use, yeah. 
or a misuse and drugs or anything to deny our feelings, yep. food, sex, anything that we can use to deny our feelings and takes us out of that present moment. If we just can face our fears, it's like, it's like turning to the monster in your dream, right? There is a gift there. There is, you, if you can face that, it is, there's a gift there. You don't think you have the strength to do it, but oh, you so do. You, every one of us has the strength to do that because they're not chasing after you to get you. They're chasing after you to give you something and to give you a piece of yourself back that you've been denying for so long. And so this whole thing of <clears throat> denying what we're feeling, denying what's in the moment, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of vulnerability and the ability to be authentic to go, I'm, I, I'm not ready for this. I'm not, I don't know how to do this, but I know that it's causing me pain and it's causing pain for everybody else around me by not admitting this, by not dealing with this. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you, when you step into that, when you take that first step to say, I need help or what's really going on, all of a sudden you are, you realize how much you're held and this is the strength that you need to move forward. And you can deal with it. It's, there's such beauty in living in the moment because this is all we have. Life is happening now. It is happening right now in this moment, in this moment, in this moment, in this moment. It's not what happened to us 20 years ago, 40 years ago. It's not what's going to happen to us next week, next year, in five years. Oh, Audrey, you are amazing. All of that is going to happen. We don't need to worry about it. Nope. All we need to worry about is what can I do right now to be present, to be, to be connected, to be, you know, living life as full as I can. And I've lost, like I said, like we didn't get so much into my brother's story. Yeah. But you felt that too, losing, losing your brother, that that was a tragic event. Yeah. He was murdered. There was gun violence. It's mental Ill, illness. It's, you know, all of this stuff. I had lawsuits to deal with. I had, I had a community that was grieving that didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And all I could do in that moment was to be present. And because I could, I really consciously went into that knowing like, there is a community that is grieving that doesn't understand. And I cannot go into that community angry. I cannot go into that community holding on to anything else. And that anger was, it was, you know, she willfully killed my brother. It was, this was premeditated. But if I held on to that, into that community, no one was going to heal. Yeah. So it was very much a conscious decision to go. She took my brother's life. I will not give her mine by holding on to that anger because the anger is only going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt anybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the beauty that I found in that community by them embracing me because I love my brother, by speaking the truth, but doing so in a manner that wasn't disparaging. Right, right, right. Because it was my, it was my brother's wife and he loved her. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so it, it's this whole thing of like really being in the moment. If I wasn't able to do that, I would have missed the beauty of that community. I would have missed the people that showed up to hold the space for me that I could hold the space for them. Yeah. And there's amazing beauty and power in being able to just be present, hold the space accept what is even though you think you can never do it we're stronger than you think we're stronger than we think yes and yes. that strength comes up in those times when we are challenged absolutely it's so funny you know i think the universe is so listening to everything and and knows everything that's going on 
in our mm -hmm. lives. And last night I, I watched a, a YouTube documentary, uh, My Darling Vivian, and it's about Johnny Cash's first wife and her trauma mm -hmm. and what she went through. But then her children, her daughters holding the space now in this documentary to say, you know, my mama was a good woman, it, even though during the time once Johnny Cash married uh, the other, the, the famous woman, everybody forgot that, uh, that there was this beautiful woman that had these children who they were seeing, but then applying them to the new wife and sh they weren't her children, they were her stepchildren and the pain that that caused and how this woman oh, yeah. made it. You know, so we begin to understand that that trauma happens to us throughout our lives and the traumas that, that happen to us, for some people, you're like, that's not a trauma. And then for other people, it's devastating. And, and so yeah. you, you can't compare. Um, and I think that we live in such a world of comparison that, that we have ripped our souls apart because yeah. we're comparing to uh, an unreal reality. Yes. Oh my gosh. Right. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you brought that up because I get this all the time. You know, people hear my story and, you know, losing eight people in a year and then having my brother murdered by his, his wife. They're like, oh, well, oh, my, my grief doesn't compare to yours. And I'm like, oh, stop. Yeah. This is not a competition. This is not something that we compare your trauma and your, you, you have the right to own that and feel how you feel. Yeah. I don't, there is no judgment around it. We're not, this is not a, you know, let's see who can, who can, you know, bear more pain. There's no comparison in that. What we feel and what we go through is what we go through and experience. That's right. And we all have the right to feel what we feel, to, to handle it the way we handle it. And then realize, like, when we know better, we do better, right? That's right. That's you know? right. That's right. And so we're, it's this continual thing of, like, okay, well, I did not handle that well. This is not my finest moment. But knowing it was the best that I could do in that moment, because that's where I was. And it's, like, now I can be more conscious of it. I can be more aware. And I could choose differently another time. Yes. Forgive yourself. Forgive others and allow us to just all honor where we're at. Yes. It's so important to do that. And to not, you know, that judgment stuff is killing us folks. You know, when you, when, when somebody does something and, and I've been a victim of judgment and, but I, I have found mm -hmm. in the last decade of my life, um, I've kind of not, I've, I, every time my, my, my subconscious mind goes there, I, I flip it. I flip it before it comes out here or before yep. it lands here, because those are the things that I have learned that, that we, we speak from comparison and we speak from judgment and our heart is always trying to say to us, stop in the name of me, stop. <laughs> and that's yeah. why last week when I said to you, peace be in me, that you should be your mantra peace be in me because if you really think that when you go out into the world that you're going to um, attract peace if you're not a peaceful person i'm here to tell you the world has taught you incorrectly it it, it there's something mm -hmm. about energy that we bring into every situation i was just having this conversation with somebody yesterday and i said to them your energy creates your drama, because every yeah. time I'm with this person, I walk away from them like this. Oh my God, oh my God. What? And you gotta like, <laughs> shake it off. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm yeah. like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> 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 and then they turn oh on music. God. Audrey talked about that. And for me, I turn on, um, I love meditation flutes, flute and indigenous uh, sounds. And so I'll turn oh, that on yeah. right away to cleanse myself of that energy because if i take it into the next situation the next communication it's going to go all it's gonna come right back right 
So yeah. like Audrey, yeah. Audrey is uh, Audrey White is available to you. Um, you can book a call with her. You can. She has free trainings and other events that um, um, that that you can take advantage of. And, and when I use the word take advantage, I don't mean in a negative way because that's how we've been taught. Those two words together are negative, meaning take advantage, grab it, <laughs> face it, right? Right. And, yeah. and, and one of the things that Audrey uh, has is the uh, ability to really move in there with you, with her intentional, you felt it this morning. We have this in, I, I, I know this woman, she's my sister. She's a part of the sisterhood of, of light because, because we've been through it. The, the moment she opened her mouth and said black sheep, I was about to cry friends because not only was I called the black sheep but I wore it as a, as a, as a wonderful little yeah. No one ever yeah. told me what it meant though, you know, other than. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And then, you know, and then and then this whole idea, Audrey gave us freedom, gave, you know, give us more freedom because I'm gonna tell you this, Audrey, and I'm sharing this for the first time with our 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 audience. As an as a black woman and a black woman who has lived through much, much, there are times that I am passionate about the underdog. I am passionate because the underdog is the black sheep. I'm passionate about creating portals of, of communication. And where, where people see that sometimes is, oh, she's angry. And what I always say to them, you have never seen the angry. What you see is, is this, this, this energy that now has been given to me because I have lived and I'm living on this other side. Um, I gotta help. I gotta help. I gotta, I gotta. That was Audrey's story. It's like, okay, I gotta help other people now. I gotta help other people now. And so yeah. stop labeling people based on what you told, what you've been told, or what television, movies, magazines, news uh, that has told you that behavior yeah. represents because it not, doesn't always represent the negative side. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. I think women in particular to, to feel an intense emotion. Oh gosh. You know, I used to teach Mia and, and, and when we went into like some really powerful, like movement or, uh, you know, Taekwondo and all of this people, women were really afraid of it. Like they were afraid to own their power. And it's like, own your anger because we have a right to be angry and but it doesn't always mean something bad it just means that like we have a right to feel all of the emotions we have a right to be passionate about our lives and what we believe in and helping other people and i truly believe that you know black women women of color you have it so much harder than than i do i i understand that this comes with privilege. I didn't ask for this, just right. like you didn't ask for, right. this is how we showed up in the world. <laughs> this is how we showed but up. But how can I use what I need to help you have a voice as well? And for you in your community to help me have a voice because we all have a right to be here. And we all have so much to learn and share with each other and to, you know, to grow in this, sense of love and community and being side by side like you said there's no there's no competition here there's just one thing going on and it's love and support and yeah. how do we move and help as many people and as many souls as we can in this earth while we're here yes that's what this is about that's what it's about. I'm so grateful for you. I am so grateful for this time we've had. So tell people, um, Audrey, how they find you and, yeah. and connect with you. Um, because I know there are, are wonderful, beautiful souls out in the Life is a Sacred Journey uh, neighborhood that, that will want to reach out to you. Fabulous. I can be found at griefcoachacademy.com. You can also go to AudreyLauraWhite.com. It'll take you to the same place right now. Um, we're doing a little construction on the website, so it's not 
fully how I want it, but it's there and it's all functional. <laughs> and when you go it's there a, to my the website, websites, right? They're terrible. Oh, it's, it's constantly, constantly evolving, just like us, right? Um, always under construction. Um, but you can go on and um, download five, sign up to get five free videos. It tells you a little bit about the Grief Coach Academy. It gives you a little bit more depth than that. I'm available Wednesday evenings for um, a free call um, that people can just jump on. You don't have to, you know, you can click on the link and sign up for it, but it's, I'm there every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, Pacific time. Okay. And you can always book a call with me. Um, right now, I, I'm in between uh, revamping a little bit with the training. So that's coming up. I don't have a training set yet. Okay. Um, but it'll be coming up in the next few months. And I also have a book coming out, uh, co-authored with Aurora Winter, called Grief Coaching. Yeah, uh, little little oh, plug for this. Uh, so paving a path from pain to peace. And it really talks about what we do at the Grief Coach Academy and, um, you know, how we help people get into the story around grief and how we all journey through it. And it's so individual. But Grief, getting through grief, isn't just about time. It is about intention. It's about having tools and skills to allow us to accept what is. Yes. And then to find that peace within ourselves so that we can move into the world, see its beauty, and still live a very full life. So I'm so grateful for you. You can find me on Instagram as well. Grief, at Grief Coach Academy or at Audrey Laura White. So thank you so much. Oh, for thank you, Audrey. Stay on for a second. The other, my friends, is that I, um, Felicia, I know you're, you're listening in. Let's get Audrey back uh, for the holiday season because I know that's a time of heightened grief for a lot of individuals. And we assume that just because maybe we love Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's that we're happy and everything that everybody else is. And, and I have found um, now in my life that, you know, my children are grown, um, patterns of life have changed a lot. Um, I don't have a significant other locally. Um, all of those things create a different feeling about the holiday season, but I have learned some things, some tips, and we'll have Audrey come back as well so that we can talk about how to get through those moments when you don't have a New Year's Eve person yeah. uh, to kiss at midnight. You know, I mean, you know, last year I kissed myself. It was pretty interesting. I, I could only, <laughs> I could only get this far. I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And then I went to bed, you know, I had one glass of champagne and I, I had, to, you know, I had all my regalia on, but, but again, you know, I had to turn it because all my other friends are, are married up or booed up or whatever. And, and, you know, it's a little different and, 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 yeah. you know, so, so we'll have Audrey come back and talk about that. Um, so friends, let's, let's, mm, put some, a lot of stuff in the chat so that Audrey can see it later on. And, and uh, thank you so much for your patience this morning as we were uh, <laughs> experiencing life, because that's what it was. And as we always end, if you're somebody out there that is feeling a, an enormous amount of grief, an enormous amount of depression to the point where you think that the world would be better off without you, please don't, 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 move to that next voice that's saying, yes, take your life. Dial 988, text 988, and talk to the people on the suicide hotline. They are incredible human beings. They are incredibly trained, but, but, but I always say this, I know some of us belong to faith-based communities and we go to our pastors and we go to our priests and we go to, I'm not telling you not to do that, but what I'm telling you, the majority of those individuals are not trained when it comes to suicide prevention. And you need to go to a counselor and someone who has that experience. So dial 988. The other is the youth crisis line. You know, I have a great love for the generations that are, are coming up 
uh, around me and beside me. And I know sometimes you think your parents don't understand and guess what, they don't. But at the end of the day, there's a youth crisis line and it's 1-800-843-5200 and they're there 24 seven. And you can bring your mom with you. You can bring your dad. You can bring your whoever your adult person is. Or you know what? You can go by yourself and get some help for you, for your family. Because the part of the healing that Audrey was talking about earlier, the sooner you can do it, the more abundant and the more happier. And the ah, life is going to open up for you in ways that it did not open up for me until I was 50-something years old almost there yeah. about okay and yeah. and and yes a lot of work had to be done didn't mean i wasn't happy because i had happy moments i had my kids and i went to disneyland life was good in some moments but i was holding on holding on oh, to traumas and my and i and my health audrey will talk about that the next time and my health was impacted by how i was feeling inside and the facade that I was taking out into the world every day because I could not be authentic. So young people, don't worry about what the bully said to you. Don't worry about if you got parents that don't know how to love you. Get your help so that when you move into that other place in your life, you can move in there with the skill set that you need to make it in this world. And then look up Audrey, uh, Audrey White, 988-1800-843-5200. Okay, friends, thank Audrey White for me. Uh, yay! Go out and hug a tree. I have found, you know, you know how I feel about trees. They're the best soul <laughs> relaxers. Hug a tree, baby. It talks to you. Pet a cat, if that's your, your pet of choice or, or, or fellow walking beast of choice. Mine happens to be dogs. So I hug a dog all the time when I go home. So whatever it is, Find connection and find comfort. And most of all, find your, find your peace. All right. Thank you for coming to Life is a Sacred Journey. The world is a marvelous, magnificent place, even though right now we're kind of jacked up and there's a lot of chaos going on. But yeah. we can shine above it. We can create relationships like Audrey and I now have that will help us get through it. So have a wonderful weekend. Stay cool. Drink a lot of water. Stay hydrated. And... <laughs> Hug yourself and love yourself, because guess what? <laughs> Nobody else might love you today, but if you love yourself, you're going to be all right. Peace, peace. Love you guys.